next one speaker this morning is Dr. Alice Marvick. Dr. Marvick is an assistant professor at the Department of Communication at the University of North Carolina and fellow at the Data and Society Research Institute in New York City. Formerly, she was the director of the McGannon Center for Communication Research and assistant professor at Fordham University. She's a frequent contributor to national media outlets in the United States, and her current research focuses on social media and the alt-right media manipulation. Dr. Marvik, you have the floor. Thank you so much for that warm welcome, and I'd like to echo how beautiful it is here and what a wonderful place this is to be speaking about a very depressing topic. Um, and I'd like to thank our hosts for having us here today. So I study social media, and for the last year and a half, I've been working with a team at Data and Society, which is a think tank that looks at the cultural implications of data-driven technologies. And we're interested in how social media specifically enables processes of coordination between far-right groups in the United States and how they spread their message and news frames using social media. So I'm going to be doing a very deep dive into some of the murkier corners of the American internet. So uh, my colleague went macro, and I'm sort of doing the micro. So this is blogger Mike Cernovich. And Cernovich identifies as part of the alt-right, a new name for an American populist movement rooted in white nationalism, xenophobia, misogyny, and anti-Semitism. And like many members of the far-right subcultures, he's very media savvy and he's very comfortable with emerging technologies. Last October, four teenagers in Chicago kidnapped a developmentally disabled man and tortured him over Facebook Live. So they were live streaming it as they were doing it. This was a big story in the US media for a few days. And Cernovich has a huge fan base, and he saw this as an opportunity. He used Periscope, which is Twitter's live streaming product, to organize his audience and come up with a way to take advantage of this publicity. Oops, sorry. They decided to link the kidnappers with the Black Lives Matter movement, and they came up with a hashtag, hashtag BLM kidnapping, they then spread through an army of coordinated Twitter accounts and bots. So here's one of his tweets. If Trump must disavow every random, random internet troll, then Black Lives Matter must disavow every crime or else they support it, BLM kidnapping. This hashtag was used 480,000 times within 24 hours. It trended on Twitter across the United States. It had so much impact that every subsequent news story about the kidnappings had to disclaim that the kidnappers were not associated with Black Lives Matter. Now, Cernovich and his audience know that messaging is reinforced through repetition. They didn't care if the mainstream media debunked this idea that the kidnappers were linked to Black Lives Matter. They just wanted it repeated. And this example really demonstrates the mechanism of mainstream media manipulation that I'm particularly interested in. And so this is a sort of chart that we made to understand how media manipulation works like a chain. So on the upper left corner, you have spaces online that are designated for far right organizing. And the messages sort of spread down the chain through mainstream social media sites to what's called the hyperpartisan far right press to the mainstream media. So up in the left, we have spaces like Image boards like 4chan and 8chan, these are the very murky corners where you only go if you're really interested in these ideas, but also a set of technologies known as alt tech. That's because in the United States, people have been working very hard to kick the alt right off of mainstream social media, and so in response, they have built their own. So Vote is a far right Reddit clone, Gab AI is a far right Twitter clone, and in spaces like this, they're sort of no holds barred, talk about whatever you want, be as extreme as you want. And in many of these spaces, people are discussing strategies and planning interventions to spread far-right messaging. They then use mainstream social media sites like Twitter, Reddit, Facebook groups, or YouTube to spread their agenda and to popularize their ideas. The most successful of these rumors and ideas are then spread through what are called the hyperpartisan far-right press. And these are sites like Breitbart, The Daily Caller, and Infowars that are re relatively new. 
They've sprung up in the U.S. in basically the last two years. And they're not fake news per se, but they deal in a very ideologically slanted worldview that sort of mixes truth, truths and falsehoods. And the most successful of the stories in this hyper-partisan far-right press then spread to the mainstream media, whether it's newspapers or cable news, and this often happens through the right-wing Fox News in the United States. So I can answer a few questions, not all questions, about this process. The first is what motivates American far-right actors. And the second is what strat strategies and tactics do they use to spread problematic information and manipulate the media? So let's start with the first. What are the motivations for this type of, these types of processes? Now the first one is just plain money. Um, there's been a lot of coverage of the so-called fake news stories that are just completely made up sensationalist claims that are clickbait, more or less. They're designed just to be spread on social media or to get many, many people viewing them, and that way they make money for the people who publish them. Um, and so BuzzFeed and the Washington Post and the New York Times have all been tracking these stories um, and these fake news sites. And in the run-up to the 2016 election in the United States, Fake news producers in the Balkans created sites that were pro-Hillary Clinton, pro-Bernie Sanders, and pro-Donald Trump, but they found that only the pro-Trump uh, sites made any money. So then they started focusing on this sort of far-right politic. The second motivation is fame. This is a young man named Milo Yiannopoulos. Uh, Milo is gay. He just married an African-American man in a ceremony that he put on Instagram. Um, he has a Jewish father, and he is very much part of the alt-right. He used to be an editor at Breitbart, and he pops up all the time on media and in newspapers and whatnot. And I don't know what Milo actually believes. I don't really care. But it's very clear to me that he's sort of latched onto the alt-right as a way to maintain a high public profile and a sort of level of fame. He got his first taste of visibility during Gamergate, which was an anti-feminist online activist campaign, and from there he affiliated himself with the alt-right. The third are trolls, or lols, or LOLs. And trolls are people who find humor, or lols, in sowing discord and causing reactions. And what trolls often share is a real antipathy and dislike of mainstream media, which they see as inaccurate, sensational, and often just plain vapid. So trolls often pull pranks that make the mainstream media look stupid. They vote somebody reprehensible onto a list of most admired Americans. They perpetrate a ridiculous rumor and have it be aired on Oprah. But they justify their trolling by saying that the mainstream media deserves it or that they're exposing its flaws. But their desire is really to create emotional impact in their targets, to get people upset or angry over something that they're doing. And then finally, and what I'm going to focus on today, are ideological motivations. So this graphic shows Pepe the Frog, who became a alt-right meme in the United States. And what it shows is a grouping of different people with different ideological agendas. So you have people who are anti-feminism, people who are anti-immigration, Southern pride, traditionalist Christians, neo-Nazis, um, the Red Pill is a pickup artist site, I'll talk about that in a little bit, and gamers. So this is a vast array of beliefs. Like, there's so many subcultures in this grouping of people. And they have different ideological motivations, but their ideologies, importantly, do not conflict. They're simply different levels on a spectrum. If you look at them, they're cohesive as a whole. Generally, what they share is an ideological pushback on liberal culture. They see this as a perceived attack on their identity. They see feminism as a movement to oppress men. They see Black Lives Matter as a, as, a move, as a racist movement against white people. And they are very anti-Semitic, and they kind of believe that the Jews are behind all of, this, uh, all of this conspiratorial thinking. They also share the same enemies, which is basically feminists, the elites, um, politicians, Democrats, Black Lives Matter, and globalists. But often what motivates individuals is spreading this message, and this becomes a type of radicalization, because they believe that mainstream culture has been lying to them, and they're motivated to spread what they see as the truth. 
And this process is called red-pilling the normies. So you may remember the 1999 science fiction film, The Matrix. In The Matrix, Morpheus asks the protagonist, Neo, played by Keanu Reeves, to choose between a red pill and a blue pill. If Neo chooses the red pill, the secrets of The Matrix will be revealed to him. If he sticks with the blue pill, he will go back to his normal, everyday life. Red pilling is the far right's equivalent to consciousness raising, or in today's lingo, becoming woke. It's waking up to what they see as reality, sexism against men, white genocide, or a vast Jewish conspiracy. They believe that this reality has been covered up by the mainstream media, that everyone is lying to you, and then they are fueled to convert other people so they too can be red-pilled and see the truth. Now, often what happens is this is done through very mainstream uh, political sentiments that then give rise to more extreme ones. So these are two examples of what I call the straw feminist, who is a straw man feminist activist. She's usually depicted with a purple mohawk and cat's eye glasses. She throws around words like trigger and microaggressions. Um, and she's sort of the caricature of somebody who is what the far right calls a social justice warrior, or basically any kind of left-wing activist or anyone who's involved in identity politics. So many people start by being red-pilled on topics like anti-feminism because they're appealing to a very young male base. And so anti-feminism is a very easy sell to these young men. Um, often we have other sentiments like anti-Islam, anti-immigration, um, anti-transgender. These are also beliefs that are more mainstream than the more radical beliefs of anti-Semitism and racism and white nationalism that the far right espouses. But these beliefs act as sort of a gateway drug to the more extreme subcultures for a lot of young people who spend a great deal of time on the internet. Now a big part of the far right is also conspiratorial thinking. Once someone becomes red-pilled in one area, they are more likely to be red-pilled in another, in the same way that believing in one conspiracy theory makes you more likely to believe in others. Once you become red-pilled, you are, you are intrinsically red-pilled on media, because if everything you thought was true is actually a lie, then it implies the media has been lying to you. And if the media is lying, why are they doing it? And the most popular theory is that the media is controlled by some sort of shadowy cabal. Who is involved in this cabal varies, but it can be the Freemasons, the Illuminati, the Rothschilds, the British royal family, but most commonly the globalists or the Jews. And the far right knows that red pilling begets red pilling, and they use these wedge issues and conspiracy theories to create inroads and red pill others. So ideology is a major motivator to, to spread problematic information. And if they can get access to the mainstream media, they can get a much larger audience than they would through their own blogs, podcasts, and spaces. So how do they actually go about doing this? How do they spread these fringe belief systems through the mainstream media? Due to their long history of trolling the media, the far right is very aware of how the mass media in the United States works. And they're able to attention hack or gain attention for their ideas by exploiting these mainstream media practices. And the first is that the far right plays on the media's love of novelty and sensationalism to get their ideas covered. So this is a shot from CNN last summer where it reads, alt-right founder questions if Jews are people. They had Richard Spencer, who is a very telegenic, uh, good-looking kind of speaks in sound bites guy, who's the more or less the American leader of the alt-right, on to talk about this. Now, nothing about these ideas are new in any way. Racism isn't new, anti-Semitism isn't new. These are all a well-worn path. But once you wrap these up in a new name, the alt-right, and you have a mediagenic spokesperson, all of a sudden it becomes a novelty. It becomes, a, it becomes new. It can be something that's reported on. And in the process, it opens the Overton window. And the Overton window is the fairly small range of ideas that are acceptable in mainstream American political discourse. And it's basically the center left to the center right. And the goal of opening the Overton window is to push the right side of that so that more far right ideas are able to be brought into mainstream discussion. And so this sort of idea, whether or not Jews are people, is not one that you normally 
is normally covered in mainstream American political discourse. But through appearing on these types of shows, they're able to open up these questions that we all thought were settled. And I'd also like to note that the Overton window has not moved correspondingly to the left. We have not seen greater discussion of socialist, communist, anarchist, lesbian separatist, freegans, anything like that. Those people have not been covered more on CNN. The American media is very invested in objectivity and presenting both sides of the story. Um, and when the far right is criticized, they often bring up this idea that there's just as much violence and discrimination on the other side. Trump even said this after the, um, the killing of an activist in Charlottesville. He said there are very bad people on both sides. And usually what they're referring to is the small movement called Antifa, which are anti-fascist activists in the United States. And they use violence to combat fascists. They're really trying to shut down white supremacy and neo-Nazis. So if there is a protest, like a, a rally of neo-Nazis, they'll try to disrupt it, for example. And there are a very small number of people. They're mostly college-age kids. They're anarchists. They're very idealistic. But they're, you know, it's a, it's a really small, small number of people. Um, but they're constantly held up in this light as this is the equivalent of the alt-right and that they constitute the alt-left. But there's really no such thing as the alt-left. Nobody in the U.S. calls himself the alt-left. It's a term that the far right actually coined and that, that has sort of spread as a way to discredit the beliefs on the people on the more leftist side of the political spectrum. I mentioned the existence of the hyperpartisan far right press. And the biggest difference, I think, between the left and the right in the United States is that the left doesn't have the same pipeline to mainstream media. Um, so, this is an example from last summer. Um, on the left, th this young man named Seth Rich was a uh, low level staffer in the Hillary Clinton campaign, and he was um, shot one evening in DC in what most people think was like a street mugging a random act of street violence. But a conspiracy theory began circulating on far-right spaces saying that he was murdered by Hillary Clinton because he was about to give information about her to WikiLeaks. <laughs> yes. And so this had been percolating in far-right spaces for several months, and then a private investigator gave a interview to the local Fox News affiliate in Washington, D.C., saying he had proof of this, that Seth Rich had been in, con in contact with WikiLeaks. And this immediately got picked up by Breitbart, by Drudge, by these other sort of more well-known online far-right media sources. And then it spread to Fox News media personalities, um, Sean Hannity and Lou Dobbs, who kind of just like hammered on it night after night. And it ended up getting mentioned by Newt Gingrich, who's a pretty mainstream Republican politician. And it became an alternative narrative at a time where Trump was, the, the news media was dominated by Trump's ties to Russia. And all of a sudden you have this like sexy new conspiracy theory that paints Hillary Clinton in a negative light. Finally, and something that I think is increasingly concerning is the fact that more and more news sources are using algorithms to bubble up or promote certain news sources over others. Um, these are automated sources, so they often look at what's getting the most attention online and they promote that. And there's a couple of examples of this so that are around the, the horrific mass shooting in Las Vegas at the beginning of October. Um, Kevin Roos found that Facebook's trending topic page for the Vegas shooting featured two different posts from Russian propaganda outlets. And very briefly, Google was uh, surfacing posts on 4chan that posited that the Vegas shooter was a member of Antifa. So Google then sort of took this down and they issued this disclaimer. Unfortunately, early this morning, we briefly surfaced an inaccurate 4chan website. Within hours, the 4chan story was algorithmically replaced by relevant results. This should not have happened. And we'll continue to make algorithmic improvements to prevent this from happening in the future. But it's not that 4chan was inaccurate. It's that 4chan was purposefully trying to game the algorithm to get visibility for their point of view. And as long as there are algorithms that increase this visibility, they will be gamed by bad actors. Second strategy is strategic ambiguity. 
So I mentioned Breitbart a number of times in this talk. It's because it's a, it's, it's kind of come out of nowhere to be this really significant online news outlet in the United States. And it's sometimes referred to as the alt-light that it espouses some of the far-right talking points, but it excludes the more extreme beliefs like racism or anti-Semitism. But actually what Breitbart does is it uses its platform to filter more extreme ideas into the mainstream. So Joe Bernstein, uh, who's a journalist at BuzzFeed who covers the alt-right, um, was given a cache of emails between Milo Yiannopoulos, an editor at Breitbart, and some of the sort of neo-Nazi and far-right leaders who have online presences. And what he found was that Breitbart does more than tolerate the most hate-filled racist voices of the alt-right. It thrives on them, fueling and being fueled by some of the most toxic beliefs on the political spectrum and clearing the way for them to enter the American mainstream. So what Breitbart was doing was they were collaborating with far right to decide what stories or talking points would be more palatable to the mainstream. And the ambiguity of the alt-light allows people to disassociate themselves with parts of the movement that they find distasteful while still working with such people on particular issues. And I need to apologize for the next image, which some people may find problematic, but I want to be realistic about the type of things that are going on in these far right spaces. So people like Milo Yiannopoulos claim that the alt-right only uses Nazi imagery to be ironic. And he compares this to 1980s heavy metal bands who often use satanic imagery to sort of annoy older people or to make young people feel rebellious or so forth. But actually, this ambiguity works as a cloak for actual white supremacists and neo-Nazis in these spaces. So Andrew Anglin is the editor of a site called The Daily Stormer, which is a white supremacist blog targeted to American millennials. And he calls this, quote, non-ironic Nazism masquerading as ironic Nazism. By using Nazi symbols, racist words, and spreading xenophobic discourse, these movements are supporting white supremacy regardless if it's ironic or not. And this ties into what's called Poe's Law. Without knowing someone's intent, it's impossible to know if they're a very good troll or a genuine kook, a genuine outlier. And a lot of the far right is this way. It's hard to tell the difference between people who are trolling Nazis and people who are Nazis, people who are trolling conspiracy theorists and people who are conspiracy theorists. And this ambivalence, again, allows for plausible deniability. It allows people to hide behind trolling and irony to spread their messaging. The third is participation and collaboration. The alt-right really takes advantage of the affordances of social media like image boards and chat rooms to collaborate on strategies and content creation. So this is a board um, on 4chan from the Vegas shooting where the members were working together to try to gain information on people involved in the Vegas situation. But what you'll notice is in these far-right spaces, there's a very low barrier to entry. Almost anyone can participate. The more experienced members will help the newbies, and it's a very collaborative environment. Another example of this is from um, the, when 8chan was working on the French election. They love Marine Le Pen, the far-right candidate, and they were working together on memes that they thought would help uh, counter Macron, the leftist candidate. So they said, here we're going to create anti-Macron and pro-Le Pen memes, trying to show how he's actually an establishment plant. We will deposit all of the memes here and discuss on what best narrative to push forward. So they came up with this, these types of things, many different rumors about Macron, the idea that he was gay, that he was having an affair with his wife's daughter. And luckily they failed. Partly this was because none of them spoke French. They didn't understand French culture. And they didn't understand French media practice. Like, they didn't understand that there is a blackout before um, the French election. So what effects does all of this have? The first is agenda setting and framing. And these are very recent screenshots of a pretty preposterous theory about Hillary Clinton colluding with the Russians on a uranium pact. Um, and this was bubbled up by Breitbart. And you see that if you search for Hillary Clinton Russia in a Google News, you're still pulling up all of these kind of far-right sources about this. And it doesn't matter, again, if the media debunks or dismisses these rumors. What, peop what the far-right wants is they want coverage because it helps them recruit like-minded people. But more importantly, 
Research shows that the amount of media coverage affects what people think is important. In this way, media manipulators are able to influence the public agenda. Their other goal is to define and frame a news story from the beginning. And research shows that when people are presented with information that, pre, that con contradicts their pre-existing beliefs, they will often double down on their original opinions rather than changing them. That it's very difficult to correct misinformation once it becomes widely known. And that's often because these stories are often more sensational and more interesting than the truth, which could be quite boring. This is quite an, a compelling graph, I think. It shows how American trust in the mainstream media has dropped from 1997 to 2016. And you'll see that it is incredibly low for Republicans, that only about 14% of Republicans now trust the mainstream media. And the impacts of this are quite significant. It inhibits the media's ability to act as a watchdog. It increases voting along strictly partisan lines. And it makes people less likely to access accurate information, which has serious civic ramifications. Finally, we are seeing far-right ideology spread across internet cultures, especially among young men. We're seeing it spread in video game culture, on Reddit, um, on science fiction fandom. And we think this is very worrisome because we think that there is a potential here for violent attacks or extremism. So some of the questions that I cannot answer, but the, the research teams and other researchers at other institutions are working on, what do these processes look like in other countries and contexts? What role do state actors like Russia play in seeding these far-right propaganda campaigns? How can we prevent red-pilling, especially of vulnerable young men who may feel alienated and disenfranchised? And how can journalists avoid falling into the trap of propagating far-right messaging unknowingly? Thank you. I'd like to thank my co-author, Becca Lewis, and the rest of my team whose research and insights made this report possible. Thank you.